David Pawson is a, is a man that I have a special love for. Uh, not only have I heard David Pawson preach over the last 25 years at various points, but uh, in recent years, David Pawson has become a friend. And on two occasions, believe it or not, after he heard me preach, he uh, wrote me a handwritten letter uh, to just comment on my preaching. Made a few points where I could have maybe done a little better, but for the most part said that he was blessed by what he heard. And uh, I can tell you, that's the kind of person you want to get to know. A person that cares that much about someone a little younger than himself. I'm not part of the Joshua generation, as, uh, as Tom Hess would say, because I'm over 40. <laughs> but I'm a, a little younger than David Pawson. But I, I consider him a mentor. Uh, this man has a commentary on every book of the Bible. <laughs> and a whole video series on the Bible. And uh, this man has invested his life in knowing and understanding and communicating the Word of God. Not many of us have that kind of discipline in our lives and commitment to the Word of God. So I want to give him lots of time. So David Pawson, would you come and bless us as you preach for us? Feel at home. You've preached for us before, and uh, so we know what we're into. It's going to be good. Bless you. After an introduction like that, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> but after that violin solo, I thought, why don't we close the service down now? The one I feel sorry for is me, <laughs> having to follow that. <laughs> well, shalom. shalom. Jesus said, if you really want to know what the government of God is like, Imagine the owner of an estate who went out at daybreak to hire workers to pick his fruit. And after agreeing to pay the regular wage of a hundred shekels a day, he sent them into the orchard. About nine o'clock he saw some others hanging around the marketplace and told them, you can go and work on my farm and I'll pay you a fair wage. So they decided to accept his offer. He went there again at noon and did the same. Even at five o'clock, there were still some men standing around idle. So he asked them, why have you been doing nothing all day? And they replied, because nobody will give us a job. He told them, you can still go and work in my fields, and I'll pay you whatever is right. When the sun set and work stopped, the employer told his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, but begin with the last ones we hired and finish with those we got first. So the ones who'd only worked one hour got their pay first and found a hundred shekels in their packets, a full day's wage. So when those at the end of the queue got theirs, they naturally expected much more than that. But they only got the same amount. When they double-checked their money, they began to complain about the way they'd been treated. It's not fair, they said. These latecomers only did an hour's labor. Yet they got as much as us. And we had toiled all day long under the blazing sun. But the boss said to their spokesman, I'm not treating you badly. Didn't we agree that a hundred shekels was a fair day's wage for a fair day's work? Take your pay and be off with you. If I choose to give them the same as I gave you, that's none of your business. I have a perfect right to do what I want with my own money, as you have with yours. Isn't your real problem envy? Because others benefited from my generosity? So said Jesus, 
When heaven rules earth's affairs, roles can be unexpectedly reversed. Those who expect to be first will find themselves at the back of the line. And those who expect to be last will find themselves at the front. Over 60 years ago, I preached my first sermon on that. <laughs> my pulpit was an armchair turned backwards. My congregation of three consisted of my mother and my two sisters. <laughs> my father was away with the car. We couldn't go to church. So my mother said, we're having a service here and you, David, will preach. And I chose this story. I read it through from the Bible. Then I went through it again and told it in my own words. Then I went through it a third time to try and get some meaning out of it. As I began to go through it for the fourth time, my older sister, in a tone of exasperation, said, Isn't that vineyard full yet? <laughs> and the whole thing collapsed into unseemly mirth. And the first attempt at preaching <laughs> ended. But it became my favorite story that Jesus told. And I want to share it with, with you again. Now about this time of year, our political parties in England have what they call their conferences to decide on their political manifesto for the next election or the next year or whatever. And our two main parties, like most countries, are right-wing and left-wing, capitalist and socialist. And as part of their conferences, they always have a public service of worship and invite a preacher to come and preach to the party. I did it once, but I won't tell you which party invited me. But funnily enough, one preacher went to the right-wing conference and preached from this parable and said Jesus was a capitalist. He would vote for us. He believed in a free market. He believed in hiring and firing. He had no trade unions to work with. This is good capitalism, the free market. Jesus would vote for us. Unfortunately, the preacher who went to the left-wing conference preached from the same story <laughs> and said Jesus was a good socialist. He believed in a minimum wage and employment for everybody and this is his manifesto, so he would vote for us. Actually, they were both doing what Satan does with the Bible, quoting bits of it and not the whole of it. And you can prove anything from Scripture if you only take a little bit and quote it. But we're going to take the whole lot this morning. Now, parables of Jesus are like scorpions. There's a sting in the tail. <laughs> and you need to listen very carefully to Jesus' stories because most of the story is ordinary, everyday life. And then there comes a complete twist to the story which says, hey, that wouldn't happen. Couldn't happen. And it's at that point that the story has moved from the earth to heaven. And heaven breaks in and the whole story turns upside down. If this was Jesus' advice on how to run industry today, then he had no understanding of personnel management. The whole thing is a disaster. You could write at the bottom of the story and they lived unhappily ever after. <laughs> he wrecked all trust, all good relationships in just one day. And if you tried to apply this to a factory or, or a farm today, you'd have a strike on your hands. Just use your imagination a bit. What do you think would happen the next morning? when he went out to hire workers. <laughs> you ever thought about that? Goes out at six, nobody there. Nine, nobody. 
twelve, three, still not. Five o'clock, long queue. <laughs> see, did you ever think of that? You see, when you read your Bible, read it with imagination. And above all, read it with feeling. I think it's so important to read the Bible with your heart, not just your mind. And I want to help you to feel this story. You just imagine that you've worked a whole week and the boss has taken on someone extra on Friday afternoon or here Thursday afternoon or whatever. And then you find that they get the exactly the same wages as you get. I know exactly how you will feel. You will say, hallelujah. I'm so thrilled for you. I'm so happy. I had to work a whole week for that, but you've only worked one afternoon. I'm just thrilled for you. Let's go out and have a drink. Let's celebrate. That's how you would feel, isn't it? No? <laughs> well, then what's gone wrong? Wouldn't you feel excited for him? No. Because one of the first things children learn to say, and they screw up their little faces when they say it, is, it's not fair. <laughs> Did your children learn to say that? I don't know who taught our children to say it. We didn't, <laughs> but they learned. You know, my mother used to give one apple to two of us and say, one of you can cut it in half, and the other has the first choice. And so one of them was cutting it and the others watching <laughs> carefully and boy it's got to be exactly right or it's not fair. And if we're not careful we go through life saying those words, if not with our lips in our lives, it's not fair. I was asked to go and visit a man in hospital who wanted to see a priest and I, I said to the matron of the hospital, I'm not a priest, I'm a pastor, but I'm willing to come and see him. And when I got to his bedside, here he was, looking, it's not fair. And he said, I said, I, I've come to talk to you. You wanted a priest, well, I, I'll talk with you. And he said, why has God done this to me? And I said, what has he done to you? He said, I'm in hospital. And he said, I've lived a good life. I've tried to be good to my neighbor. Why has God done this to me? I said, have you never been in hospital before? Never, he said, I've lived a good life, never been in hospital. I said, how old are you? He said, 95. <laughs> and here he is, surrounded by pretty nurses doing everything for him. Some of us would give a right arm for a bit of that. <laughs> It's not fair. It's not fair. Now that's at the root of this story. You see, if you're not careful, if you live in the kingdom of earth, you will side with the workers in this story. And you will say you are less than fair to the boss. If you're of the kingdom of heaven, You'll side with the employer here and you'll say he was more than fair. That's the big question. Was he less than fair or more than fair? Less than fair, we are so upset if we're treated with what we regard as injustice. You see, we live in a society that is based on M-E-R-I-T. And we believe that we should have what we deserve. We fight for our rights. That's the big word now. Rights. It was an Englishman called Paine who wrote the book The Rights of Man. And it's gone the world round. And it was quickly followed by a book called The Rights of Women. And both are now with the clenched fist saying, my right, my right. And if we're not careful, we go right through life with that attitude of the kingdom of the earth. What do I merit? What do I deserve? Why was he treated better than I was? That's almost an instinct in us. 
But in the kingdom of heaven, you soon learn you have no rights whatever. Now, in our house, we have a, a ritual early morning, uh, which I was never into before I married. And uh, it's because my wife needs a daily fix before she gets going. It's a cup of tea. And I'll tell you a secret. If I wake up and feel like a Christian, I make it. If I wake up and I don't feel like a Christian, I don't make it. And I must say, I don't often feel like a Christian first thing in the morning. But if I make it, I have to go downstairs and go out into the cold outside the front door and pick up two cold white things. Because in England, we get the milk delivered to the doorstep. And when I pick up those two cold pints of milk and clutch them to my breast and walk back in, every time I think of a verse from the book of Lamentations. <laughs> and the verse is, your mercies are fresh every morning. <laughs> and I think of my mercies. See, not merits. The kingdom of heaven operates on M-E-R-C-Y. Kingdom of earth operates on M-E-R-I-T. And as I come back in, I thank God for his mercies. I'm 78, still able to get around. What a mercy. I have work to do. What a mercy. Have a roof over my head. What a mercy. You don't deserve any of these things. If God gave me what I deserved, you wouldn't have a preacher this morning. I'll tell you something else. There'd be nobody else out there. Merit or mercy. Now, I want to major on mercy this morning and say two things which are a bit complicated but which we need to grasp. First is this. Mercy and justice are not opposites. They're not against each other. They travel the same road. The only difference is justice goes so far and mercy goes further. Justice will give you what you deserve. Mercy will go further and give you what you never deserved. Got the difference? So they're not, it's not justice or mercy. They travel together, they're sisters. And God is both just and merciful. He will give everybody what they deserve. I find that frightening. But his mercy goes further and gives people what they never deserved. You got the difference? That's the first thing about mercy that I wanted to make clear. The second thing is this. Mercy is at the disposal of the one who exercises it. We have no right to mercy. We've got a right to justice. Nobody has a right to mercy. And as the Bible says in the Old and the New Testament, God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Nobody can tell God who to have mercy on. Now, how does he choose those who receive mercy? Because I want to tell you this, out of all the people here, some are going to go away from this service with God's mercy and others are not. So how does God choose? Let me say straight away, it's not a lottery. It's not a matter of luck. It's amazing how many people think that it's luck or is it, it's your num number coming out of the lottery today. People go to healing meetings saying, will it be my night? Will I get lucky? Will I get healed? Will I get a blessing this morning? Will, it, will God pick my name out of the hat? God doesn't do that. The word luck or chance is not in kingdom vocabulary. The Hebrew word for luck is gad. And the old English used to say by gad. Meaning, now they say, the best of British luck. 
But there's no luck in the kingdom of God. There's no chance. It's not by Gad, it's by God. And God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And God is going to choose this morning or this afternoon now who's going to have mercy here. And so the vital question which I want to ask and answer is how does God choose those who receive his mercy? Is there a pattern? Is there anything in Scripture which will give us hope that we might receive his mercy this, this afternoon? Well, there are three answers in the Bible that I want to give you. Very simple, but very profound. The first is this, very simple. God shows mercy to those who ask for it. Could anything be simpler? And yet I've listened to thousands of prayers in my lifetime. And people have asked for healing, for safety, for finance, for health, for so many things. But I rarely hear somebody ask for mercy. I hear it when I go to preach in prison. I hear it from people who are desperate. And you've got to be desperate for it. Because anyone who says, God, be merciful to me, is really at the bottom. I don't deserve anything. And I'm afraid we are often so respectable and so good Christians, we don't often say, please, be merciful. Another story Jesus told of two men who went to the temple here to pray. And one man went right up to the front and he really prayed. He, he could really pray. The trouble was he used the wrong word five times. I thank you that I am not like other men. I fast twice in the week. And I give tithes of all that I possess. Amen. Did you spot the wrong word? <laughs> and it was all true. He, he did do all that. that. That was his life. And yet Jesus said his prayer got no higher than the ceiling. In fact, Jesus said he prayed thus with himself. He wasn't praying with God. He was praying with himself. And uh, he felt much better for it. And there was a man at the back, a man at the back who wouldn't even lift up his eyes, beat his breast. God, be merciful to me. I said. And Jesus said that man went home right with God. Amazing. Now he was a tax collector and though we don't like inland revenue and the Israelis call the tax office here the Wailing Wall. <laughs> I know we don't like tax collectors but do you know what a tax collector is? I only found out when I went to Poland and a Jew took me round the old ghetto, showed me the railway line where they were taken off to Treblinka to be took me to Treblinka and I walked on the ashes of Jews. He told me what a tax collector is. He said the Germans walled us in, hundreds of thousands in a tiny space, and they wanted money from us, taxes. But the Germans didn't dare come into the ghetto, of course. They'd have been lynched if any of them came in. So they invited applications from the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto who were willing to collect the taxes for the Germans. And the offer to them was, we will give you a quota and provided you meet that quota every quarter, you can keep everything else you can get. And if anybody refuses what you demand from them, report them to us and they'll be dealt with. So the tax collectors were Jews 
collecting from other Jews and lining their own pockets. Blackmail is the word. Or in modern language, they were in the protection racket. That's what a tax collector was in Warsaw and that's what they were in Jesus' day. Blackmailers, protection rackets. And this was this man. And you know my imagination, I love reading the Bible with my imagination. I think of him going home <laughs> and his wife saying, have you had a good day at the tax office? Haven't been at the tax office. That's enough to get a wife asking questions. Where have you been? I've been in the temple. You? What were you doing? Blackmailing the priests now? No, I was praying. You? Praying? You haven't prayed since we got married, none, but you never did before that. And you think him upstairs would listen to the likes of you? He did. How <laughs> different. What a story. Now when I went to Nuremberg in Germany years ago, there was one building I wanted to see. And they showed it to me. It's a prison where after the war, 21 Nazi war criminals were taken and put in prison awaiting trial for the murder of 30 million people, including 6 million Jews. And each of those 21 criminals was offered two things free of charge. A lawyer to defend them and a chaplain to look after their souls. Now 16 of them were Lutherans and asked for a Lutheran pastor to look after them. Five were Roman Catholics and asked for a priest. And so the American authorities searched for a Lutheran pastor and found an army chaplain, Padre Gerica, who was of German extraction. His people had moved to America and he had volunteered for the American forces as a pastor and became a chaplain. And so he was brought in to look after 16 Nazi war criminals. But before he was brought in, they invited him to do this, and he said, never. The Germans killed my two boys. I'm not going to look after them. But God had different ideas. <laughs> and here he is, the first Sunday morning, a congregation of 16 of the worst men in the world. And he didn't know what to talk to them about, so he just told them about the cross and about Jesus. Saukel was the first, and he fell on the ground. God, be merciful to me. Von Ribbentrop was the second, and he was found in his cell on the floor. God, be merciful to me. One after another asked God for mercy, and got it because they asked I suppose it's one prayer that God can't refuse to answer because he loves it. But two of them refu refused. One was Rudolf Hess who spent 40 years in Spandau jail in Berlin and finally hung himself with a piece of electric flex from the light. And the other was the big fat head of the Luftwaffe Hermann Goering and uh, he refused to listen. And his m wife and little girl came to say goodbye to him before he was going to be hung. And his little girl said, Daddy, please trust in Jesus. I want to see you in heaven. And he pushed her away. He said, you believe in your way. I'll believe in mine. And an hour later, he managed to kill himself with cyanide that he'd hidden. But the others accepted. You know, I was sharing this in our church in Guildford and an architect whom some of you will know uh, came to me afterwards 
And he said, David, I was a British soldier in the occupation of Germany after the war. And when that trial was on, he said, we spent whole nights in prayer for those men. And we never knew that God had heard. <laughs> and I'm in a house in Newbury on Thames, near where we live, in a house meeting. And when I told this story, a young couple became quite hysterical. They were crying and laughing. And I stopped. I said, would you like us to pray for you? They said, no, carry on. I said, look, my wife would take you into the next room and talk to you. And they said, no, carry on. And so I did. And then, when the meeting was over, I went to the couple and I said, why were you so disturbed? And she said, Keitel was my uncle. And she said, we've lived for 25 years under the black cloud. As soon as people find out who I am, they won't talk to me. She said, we went to Australia. They found out I was Keitel's niece. Nobody would talk. We went to Canada. As soon as they found out, nobody would talk. And we've been running away. We've come to England, and now they've found out. And she said, now you tell me that my uncle is in heaven? She said, the cloud is gone. And she said, now if anybody says to me, Keitel was your uncle, I will say, yes, he was, and he's in heaven with Jesus, and will you be? She said, that's what I'll say. <laughs> and she was released. Why don't we ask for mercy? It's there. He's mercy full. But we don't ask because we don't think we're bad enough. You've got to feel pretty bad to ask for mercy. You've got to feel you have nothing whatever to plead with for God except His mercy. That's the first of the three answers. I won't take as long with the second and third. But the first answer, who is God going to bless with his mercy in this congregation? Answer one, those who will ask for it. Did you come to this meeting seeking God's mercy? Then I've good news for you. Ask him. But there are two other qualifications. And number two is this. God gives mercy to those who pass it on. Now here's the rub. And God, Jesus told another story about a man who owed a huge sum of money to the king. And when the day came for the debt to be repaid, he hadn't got it to pay. So he went to the king and he begged him, Your Majesty, please give me more time to pay. I'll get the money together, but I need more time. And the king said, I'll do better than that. We'll cancel the debt. It's all off. And it says that man went down to the palace kitchen and got hold of one of the cooks by the throat and was shaking him and saying, when are you going to pay me that money you owe me? And it was a tiny sum. And the king heard and called the man back said, I forgave you your debt, but I'm canceling my forgiveness. The debt is back on, and you go to prison until you pay the last penny. And then Jesus said a terrible thing, which I've never heard a preacher preach on. Even so, your heavenly Father will do to you if you do not forgive. Wow. <coughs> Forgiveness can be cancelled. Did you ever hear a preacher say that? Well, you have now. What a thought. He shows mercy to those who pass it on. I remember preaching in a town hall in the middle of England. And uh, I preached on God's mercy. It's a wonderful subject. Afterwards, three people came to me. 
The first was a middle-aged lady and she said, years ago, my next door neighbor called me a devil. And she said, it really went in and it stuck in my heart. And she said, I've disliked that woman ever since. And she said she moved away from the district and uh, I forgot about it. But she said, tonight, as I heard from God, I've forgiven that woman from my heart. And she said, I turned round and she was sitting behind me in the meeting. And the second was another lady about the same age. She said, Mr. Pawson, tonight I've forgiven my brother. I said, what for? She said, when I was a little girl, he had sex with me and spoiled my life. She said, it was painful. She said, I've never had a boyfriend since. And I've never married. And I've been afraid of men. She said, tonight I've forgiven him. And the third was a young couple, a delightful little couple. And as they came towards me, they were both crying. And he said, you tell him. And she said, you tell him. And he said, no, you tell him. And they were saying this all the way. I said, well, one of you, please tell me. What is it? And they said, we've been married about 18 months. And then she got pregnant. And they got their first child. It was so happy but the doctor said this child may not live until it's five got a rare disease and she said I've been so angry with God she said oh, God you give healthy babies to everybody else why us and she said I've really been cursing God and you may find this blasphemous but she said tonight I've forgiven him <laughs> And I've asked for his mercy. <laughs> and I said, now you'll find out what God can do for your little boy. You see, forgiveness is like electricity. It can't come in if it's not going out. It's got to flow through. It's got to be passed on. That's why Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And if you don't pass it on, it just blocks up the whole thing. And it can't flow in either. That's serious, isn't it? Any unforgiveness, any resentment, bitterness against people. I had a, a well-dressed man come up to me after a meeting some time ago and he said, uh, David, I've got stuck in my Christian life. He said, would you pray that I can get going again? He said, I was moving well, I was growing and I was developing and maturing, but he said, I've just stopped. And I looked at him and I said, it's a will. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, a will. I said, you know the old saying, where there's a will, there's relatives. <laughs> do you know that saying? And uh, then he got the point. And I said, whose will are we talking about? Oh, he said, be my father's. I said, what was wrong with that? He said he left all the money and the business to my brother. And as he said it, his face screwed up and said, it's not fair. And I said, can you recall when you got stuck in your Christian life? He said, uh, do you know, he said, I think it was about the time my father died. <laughs> I said, it sure was. I said, I can get you going e quickly, easily. How, he said. I said, all you've got to do is to go to your brother and say, I'm so glad you got the money. And then I just was silent. I just watched his face. I wished I'd had a cameo, a camera, just to take it, his expression. every imaginable expression went on his face and finally his face lit up and he says I'll do it <laughs> he got going just like that but let me tell you another story which is the other side of it 
I was back in our old church in Chalfont St. Peter in Buckinghamshire, and they, they brought a, a poor woman to me in a wheelchair. She was absolutely crippled with arthritis from head to toe, twisted up. And they said, would you please pray for mother? And I said, I will, after I've asked a question. I said to her, who is it that you hate so much? And she spat it out. She said, my husband. And I said, I don't want to know what he did to deserve your hatred, but I said, I have to tell you that as long as you hate him, we can't pray for you. She said, I never will forgive him. And they wheeled her away. The rule number two, God shows mercy to those who ask for it. He shows mercy to those who pass it on and who don't harbor unforgiveness and bitterness. And that may touch one or two of you here. Bitterness against a boss, against a colleague at work, against husband, wife, even against children or parents. Don't block God's mercy. And the third and last thing is, again, simple, because really truth is simple, isn't it? God shows mercy to those who ask for it, to those who pass it on, and thirdly, for those who don't take advantage of it. One day they brought a woman to Jesus caught in the act of adultery. You know, you have to be Jewish to understand that story. She deserved to be stoned to death. But so did the man. And if they'd caught her in the very act, they'd let him go. That was the first illegal thing in the whole encounter. Both she and the man should have been stoned. Of course, they did it as a trap for Jesus. Because if he agreed to the stoning, he'd be in fall foul of the Romans who forbade Jews to do that. If he didn't, he would fall foul of all the rabbis and the scholars who would say, you're not obeying the law of Moses. Second thing is, he said, he that is without sin can throw the first stone. Now that is the most misunderstood verse by Gentiles. It does not mean you've got to be sinless before you can punish. Otherwise parents couldn't punish. Police could do nothing. Right. It's ridiculous. It is the Jewish culture and tradition based on the Word of God that anyone who has committed the same crime cannot be a witness in the case. So Jesus was saying, if any of you has not committed adultery, you can throw the first stone. And they went away one by one, beginning with the eldest. The youngest tried to brazen it out, but finally they all went. Now at that point, no one could condemn the woman. Not even Jesus could, legally. Because there had to be two or three witnesses for the death penalty. So Jesus, he didn't say, I forgive you. He said, I don't condemn you. He couldn't, not by the law of God. He had to let her off. He had to say, case dismissed. Now do you understand the story a bit better? But what he did say to her was this. Leave your life of sin. I'm literally translating which means that it wasn't a one-off, one-night stand she'd been caught in. It was a regular way of life. And he said, you leave that way of life. He said, I don't condemn you, but don't do it again. I wonder what if he would have said if she'd been brought back three months later. I was in the Middle East on a balcony of a hotel three stories up looking down at the dusty road below and I saw a group of Arabs hauling a young girl by the hair 
along in the dust and she was totally naked and I said to two missionaries who I, I was standing with we must stop that can't we do anything and he said no you mustn't the mosaic and the uh, Muslim law are the same she's been caught in adultery she's got to pay the penalty boy that made that story come alive for me there it was it was the law but Jesus said don't do it again now I want you to imagine that you're down at the seaside and suddenly you notice there's someone in the water struggling and shouting save me save me I'm drowning and you pull your jacket off pull your shoes off you dive in you pull them out you pump them dry and they say oh thank you so much you've saved my life and they turn around and jump back in <laughs> and shout save me save me I'm drowning I can't swim and you're just getting your jacket and your shoes back on but you pull them off you dive back in pull them out pump them dry and they say oh I'm doubly grateful to you you've saved my life twice and then they turn around and jump back in it may sound ridiculous you laughed at the idea but you've done that and so have I you are the man you are the woman we say Jesus forgive me I'll never do it again and you turn around and you get in the same mess save me save me now how many times would you pull that person out of the water 70 times 7 I wouldn't long before that I'd say you don't want to be saved or you just enjoy the experience of being saved <laughs> do you see what I mean Jesus came not to save us from hell that's a bonus thrown in he came to save us from our sins that's why he came so that we could get rid of them <laughs> the freedom that Christ offers no one else can give you it's the freedom not to sin and nobody has that freedom outside of Christ so here we are approaching Yom Kippur when the chief rabbi will put in the Jerusalem Chronicle a list of sins of people to repent of and usually about number 11 is traffic <laughs> the way people drive of course they all learn to drive on a tank here and you know what that result is and he calls them to repent does that change the traffic no repentance as a schoolboy said is being sorry enough to stop that's repentance and if we really mean it you know churches that use prayer books use the word repent almost every week ye that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and then the congregation responds with we do repent of all our sins that's a huge thing to say if they repented of one a week there would be 52 sins gone in just one year repentance means stop doing it and God doesn't show mercy to those who go on doing it you can come to the end of God's patience he's a very patient God slow to anger full of mercy nevertheless you can come to the end of taking advantage of God like the poet Heine he was German birth Jewish finished up in Paris lifetime of sin and abuse and is finally dying and they said do you want a priest he said I don't need one but they sent one anyway and the priest came and asked if he wanted to make confession and he simply said dear my partner métier God will forgive me that's his trade that's taking advantage <laughs> So now you know whether you want to receive mercy this morning, don't you? Did you come seeking mercy, wanting to ask him for it? Did you come free from 
any bitterness or unforgiveness towards anyone else? And did you come determined not to do it again? Then God's mercy is for you. Let's pray. Righteous Father, you're so merciful and we take advantage of it. We forget that every act of forgiveness costs the blood of your Son. It costs you so much. Lord, I want to pray now for anybody in this congregation to whom you've been speaking personally. Will you please now show them what they need to do? very practical if they need to make a phone call sign a send a letter whatever Lord will you please show them what to do and give them the grace to do it that they may flow in your mercy God we're all sinners there's not one of us deserves anything at all from you we have no rights whatever but we can ask you for mercy. Grant us what we shall never deserve, but in your grace. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.